Hi and welcome. In this video, we'll explore how people make electronic circuits without formal etched printed circuit boards. Popcorn Electronics. At Popcorn Electronics, we curiously explore, learn, and share our observations while enjoying all of our time at our electronics workbench. Thank you for watching. Popcorn Electronics. After World War II, the printed circuit board took off. However, people continued to make circuits without printed circuit boards. Whether it was wrapping wire around terminal posts or point-to-point -point soldering, a small subset of companies and individuals built their circuits without printed circuit boards. In this video, we'll focus on what has historically been called dead bug construction. If you take an integrated circuit and place it upside down on a copper clad board, it kind of looks like a dead bug. Hence the name. Let's take a moment and focus on the copper clad board. There are many types of grounds and these may cause confusion to new builders. For example, there's earth ground, digital ground, or component ground. Our copper clad board is a large area ground plane. At DC to about 30 or 40 megahertz perhaps, the ground plane provides a common low resistance or low impedance return path for our circuit currents. So that big old piece of copper sheet is a low impedance ground plane to help minimize inductance and resistance for our circuit return currents to flow. Further, the copper clad board may help dissipate heat and help reduce electromagnetic and radio frequency interference to and from our circuit. In a typical single supply design, the ground plane is connected to the negative battery terminal. Excitedly, in the next minute or two, I'm going to build this low distortion, low noise, simple audio power amplifier. Further, we'll briefly test and listen to this audio amplifier through a speaker after the build. I'll make this amplifier using ugly construction because I'm an ugly construction builder. However, at the end of the video, I'll briefly go over Manhattan construction. Both ugly construction and Manhattan construction are variants of dead bug circuit building. This video promotes awareness about how people make circuits without using a printed circuit board. This video is not about how to solder or how to make electronic circuits. You'll have to learn that elsewhere. Please read the important information on this slide. When I was 14, my dad took me to a professional electronics technician to learn how to solder. I learned about eye safety, about the dangers of rosin core solder fumes, about exposure to lead from solder, and about fires, and I had to learn how to use a fire extinguisher. He also told me that when I build something, whether it be from a kit or something I designed, never leave its power supply plugged into the household mains electricity when it is unattended. Be safe. If you decide to make an electronic circuit, there are risks and potential consequences. Please learn about circuit safety before you decide to build an electronic circuit. Thank you. Inspired by this book, a well-regarded amateur radio operator, physicist, and electrical engineer, Wes, amateur call sign W7ZOI, coined the term ugly construction. Wes and his son Roger penned two articles, The Ugly Weekender, basically a part one and two, a transmitter and a receiver. And that's when I first learned about ugly construction. And from DC to HF, that's pretty much all I use. In Wes's ugly construction, grounded component leads are soldered directly to the copper clad board ground plane. We'll just call that ground from now on. Non-grounded component leads are suspended over the copper clad board by high value resistors called standoffs. Please consider this circuit. Note the 10 meg ohm standoff resistors. We also have a series 510 ohm current limiting resistor and this particular LED actually flashes so you can see it on video. I quickly breadboarded this circuit so you might view this ugly 
Brand board. Recently, I helped one of my readers come up with an audio power amplifier design, a very simple project. I thought I'd build it and then go through some of the design criteria. This little power amplifier should give you an idea how builders use ugly construction on their benches. The active devices include an NPN and PNP transistor set up as push-pull emitter followers. I chose the 2N4401, 2N4403 pair. I don't think that's critical. One half of the ultimate popcorn op amp, the 5532, also gets used. Now is the time to purchase the NE5532 as it circles the drain of obsolescence. I've noticed the price of the DIP version has doubled. I'm straightening pin 4 so that it can be soldered directly to the copper clad board. It also serves as a landmark so I can identify the various pins of that IC. I do not use resistors as standoffs in my ugly construction. Rather, I use a technique I learned in Ukraine in 2010 from a builder named Alexie. Alexie does not use resistors nor Manhattan pad standoffs because they slow him down too much. He uses capacitors as standoffs, usually the bypass capacitors. Further, he strategically uses normal parts of the circuit as standoffs, for example voltage dividers where one of the resistors is grounded. His circuits look compact, very sturdy, and they're very difficult to describe and even more difficult to photograph because they just look like a big mess. However, I've adopted his technique. Experienced builders will decide which technique is the safest and the best for themselves. Note that for this circuit, I'm not performing a compact build. I'm performing a spacious build so that people can see what's going on. It actually feels awkward for me. In this segment, I'm building the DC input low pass filter and establishing the positive power rail. My DC voltage is 12.3 volts. The 0.1 and 220 microfarad capacitors serve as standoffs supporting that 22 ohm resistor and the DC rail. Alexia recommends using capacitors with stiff leads for structural integrity. Back to the schematic. There's an additional 0.1 microfarad RF bypass capacitor on pin 8. This capacitor has fairly short leads and is connected right to pin 8 of the upside down 5532. So pins 4, 8, and the voltage divider on pin 3 well anchor that upside down 5532 op amp. Then I dealt with pin 3. First, I attached a 22K resistor to pin 3. I placed it at an angle away from the op amp body to allow better access to pins 1 and 2. I also connected the series 22K 1 half voltage divider and the 220 microfarad bypass capacitor. That capacitor functions to filter noise at the voltage divider. After pin 3 was sorted, I connected a solid core wire from the DC supply rail to the top of the voltage divider feeding pin 3. And finally, I connected a wire from the DC supply rail to pin 8 of the op amp. After completing the work on pin 3, it was time to perform DC testing. I started by measuring the DC input voltage, 12.3 volts, and then moving my clip, which was a little stubborn, to the other side of the 22 ohm resistor. The voltage drop across that 22 ohm resistor was 0.06 volts, therefore my op amp was drawing 2.73 milliamps. I then measured at pin 3 to confirm that the voltage at pin 3 was half of the DC supply. Everything looked good. It was time to finish pins 1 and 2 and move on and complete this amplifier. 
After DC testing, I attacked pin 2, the inverting input of the op amp. Pin 2 needs AC coupling to ground through a 1K ohm resistor and a 4.7 microfarad capacitor. For capacitors of 4.7 microfarads and less, I use metallized polyester film caps because they offer lower distortion than using electrolytic. Often what parts you use is dependent on what parts you have in stock and experienced builders will decide what parts they'll use in a given situation. The 4.7 microfarad capacitor was placed so it doesn't crowd pin 1. Further, I left a good centimeter of lead length on the resistor connecting to pin 2. This was another trick I learned from Alexier. You build out from your IC with your components so that it makes it easier to solder to your IC. I try to think ahead to avoid painting myself into a corner and creating further build misery. I apologize for the focusing issues. This is a new camera and I've got a lot to learn. Here I'm connecting a 22 PF cap between pins 1 and 2 to reduce the open loop bandwidth of this op amp. This reduces the chance of the op amp oscillating or squealing. I could have chosen any value between say 10 and 100 PFs for this cap. The value isn't critical. I've already installed the output followers and their diode bias stack, so I'll focus on the output capacitor. In some cases, the output impedance of an audio power amp might be just fractions of an ohm. So I tend to use larger capacitors. So here I use a 470 microfarad capacitor in order to get some bass response in my amplifier. Following the techniques of Alexier, the 470 microfarad capacitor serves as a standoff as well. The speaker side of the capacitor is grounded via a 1K resistor. This 1K resistor is in parallel with their 8 ohm nominal impedance speaker. The other side of the capacitor gets connected to the emitter followers via 1 ohm emitter degeneration resistors. The 1 ohm resistors will help prevent the output followers from going into thermal runaway in an adverse event. After completing the circuit, I did a general inspection looking for shorts and for cold solder joints. As you age, you shake more and generate more cold solder joints, I've noticed. After that, I took my scraper and went around and cleaned some of the flux off the copper clad board and then swept it away with a little horsehair brush. Now that the circuit is done, it's time to test it. The only thing better than building circuits is testing circuits and using your instruments on the bench. And many people, me included, love this. On the input, I'm tack soldering a one microfarad capacitor to pin three, which is the op amp input. And to that capacitor, I'm tack soldering some coaxial cable, which goes to a one kilohertz or more signal generator. On the output side, I'll temporarily solder in an 8 ohm dummy load so that I can test the output with my oscilloscope or DSO. Just prior to testing, I'll show that 8 ohm dummy load. I just placed four 1 watt resistors in parallel and measured 7.9 ohms resistance. I'll also show the test schematic for sake of completeness. And now, for the moment of truth, hit the switch, turn on the signal generator, and adjust its output pot to put the amp in and out of clipping, and to celebrate the fact that it actually works. I calculated the maximum very clean output power at 288 milliwatts, which is what I expected for this amp. You can't expect the low current, low impedance op amp output to drive a pair of followers into a significant amount of 
clean signal power. However, if you add one more pair of medium power output transistors in either emitter follower or compound form, you can turn this into a very good audio power amplifier. I think I did this in a receiver called Regen 5 on my blog. I'm going to connect the input to a CD player and move it away from the front of my bench so it's not near the power supply and all my humming instruments. I obviously can't play a copyrighted song. I'm just going to play a drum track, a jam drum track. This amp is surprisingly loud and there's no hum. I love it. conclude this section on ugly construction and move on to Manhattan construction. The uptake with ugly construction seems very poor. It seems that people do not like making ugly circuits. People have an aesthetic, an ideal, they like to be craftsmen, they like to take their time and make beautiful things. This video may be the only exposure to ugly construction you'll ever get. There is no one definition of ugly construction. People may use this term generically to refer to this sort of dead bug or ground plane construction, whether it's Manhattan or ugly or some other form, some hybrid form. And finally, there are builders who refuse to accept anything less than a printed circuit board as a legitimate object of their circuit construction. End of story for them. Manhattan style standoffs are purchased or cut or stamped out of single-sided copper clad board. These standoffs are insulated on the backside and get glued to the copper ground plane strategically to serve as standoffs for ungrounded component leads. Grounded leads get soldered to the copper clad board just like in ugly construction. Apart from using the Manhattan pad standoffs, I think the main difference between ugly construction and Manhattan construction is the parts are normally upside down and Manhattan builders tend to use way more standoffs than ugly construction style builders. Here's a schematic of that flashing LED built Manhattan style. The Manhattan pads exhibit a small amount of capacitance that is insignificant from DC to say HF. Uh, ugly construction is not better than Manhattan and Manhattan is not better than ugly construction. The small amount of capacitance exhibited by each pad gets absorbed by the circuit and it's only significant if you're making a variable frequency oscillator where you want all capacitance to have a low temperature coefficient or a well-defined temperature coefficient. Okay, I'm done. If you seek information on soldering or electrical or electric circuit safety or Manhattan construction or ugly construction, there's abundant resources online. Thanks for watching to the end. Cheers.